have been well trained, my young apprentice. They will be no match for you. Okay. So in the last episode, we saw how liberalism as a philosophy is historically contingent on the class interests of the bourgeois and the economics of capitalism. So now, let's look at how this impacts liberal theory. Wikipedia describes liberalism like this. Liberalism is a political and moral philosophy based on liberty and equality. Liberals espouse a wide array of views depending on their understanding of these principles, but generally support civil rights, democracy, secularism, gender equality, racial equality, internationalism, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and freedom of religion. And this is a common conception. But if we look at the actual writings of some of the key liberal thinkers, we often find a different story. A phantom haunts liberalism. The phantom of economics. You see, liberals were happy to use all these nice-sounding values to build coalitions in the population to resist absolutism when the bourgeois were just one of the classes oppressed by the nobility, but they were not willing to follow them through to the extent that they might disrupt their class interests once it was their class that was empowered. And the last people most classical liberals wanted to follow these ideas through for were the masses. But what do I mean by bourgeois class interests? Well, as we looked at in the last episode, the power of the bourgeois class was based on private property. Through the transatlantic trading culture, they had amassed property, and it was by the assertion of the power of their property that they had organized as a class and sidelined or destroyed the absolutist regimes of the former nobility. Thus, to protect their interests, private property had to be immune from all political action. This is argued by liberals from the very start, as John Locke puts it. The supreme power cannot take from any man any part of his property without his own consent. For the preservation of property being the end of government, and that for which men enter into society, it necessarily supposes and requires that people should have property. Hence, it is a mistake to think that the supreme and legislative power of any commonwealth can do what it will, and dispose of the estates of the subject arbitrarily, or take any part of them at pleasure. So we see for Locke, property must be unconditionally cut off beyond the political realm. For him, it is the basis of society and humans enter society not for mutual aid, but to defend their property. Thus property must be held as an assumption of society. Of course, there's no mention here of people who don't have property. Later, Mill suggests that, while ideas against property may be tolerated, speaking actively against property, or any political threat to it, may be culpable. An opinion that corn dealers are starvers of the poor, or that private property is robbery, ought to be unmolested when simply circulated through the press? but may justly incur punishment when delivered orally to an excited mob assembled before the house of a corn dealer, or when handed about among the same mob in the form of a placard. By the way, if anyone wants to try and imply my criticism of Mill on this point contradicts my use of him in my previous video on Gab and free speech, I think it all comes down to the problems of Mill's harm principle, which I mentioned there. Mill defines threats to capitalist property as harm. I disagree. This is why I pointed out the paradox of tolerance is a better measure so I don't see these two approaches to Mill as conflicting. In fact, I would see this as an illustration of the bad effects of the woolly harm definition, as here he uses it to theoretically suppress speech to protect property, which I would myself see as a harmful institution. And that is certainly the view of any left philosophy aiming at redistribution, the view of socialists. To be clear, socialists, communists, and socialist anarchists, also known as proper anarchists unlike the ANCAP edgelords, do not want you to not have stuff. The critique of private property does not say you shouldn't have a home and things to put in it. This is often differentiated from private property by calling it personal property. The private property we critique is the ownership of the means of production. That is to say, owning privately tools which require more than your own labor, thus allowing you to employ people to work for your own profit. For example, owning a factory. Socialists hold that these means of production, and by extension of survival, especially under capitalism, should belong to everyone, and particularly those who work them at any given time, equally, so their benefit can be shared by those whose labour creates them, and by society as a social good, 
rather than allowing only a few people to hoard their benefits. This hoarding has been a massive source of inequality across the ages, even before liberalism, as shown by the fact that the surnames of the most influential and wealthy Brits seem to have changed little since the Norman invasion of 1066. And this isn't just a UK problem. In Florence, in Italy, the wealthiest families today are much the same as they were in 1427. I may save going into these examples in depth for another time though, as this video is already long enough. Getting back to the point, as we see here, these philosophers, in line with their bourgeois interests, wanted to defend private property from all political attack. But once they were no longer being taxed by a wealthy monarch on a whim, who was the threat to private property? The answer is of course the propertyless masses, and oh boy, do these classical liberals hate the idea that the masses should get any share in their property, and by extension, their power. As Mill put it, There is a majority of poor, a minority who, in contradistinction, may be called rich. Is there not a considerable danger lest they, the poor majority, should throw upon the possessors and the larger incomes an unfair share or even the whole of the burden of taxation. And wouldn't that be a terrible thing? Sound familiar? This is the rich of their time, like today, demanding not to pay tax for the poor, rejecting any attempt to produce financial equality. Better to let them starve, it seems, than share any of the wealth they make for you by their labour. But aren't liberals in favour of equality? What about the French Revolution? Liberté, égalité, fraternité, and all of that? Well, this did not extend to the masses. Even in the first half of the 19th century, so shortly after the revolution, you had French liberal theorists like Benjamin Constant, who showed just what they thought of the unpropertied masses' desires for political equality. Notice that the necessary aim of those without property is to obtain some. All means you grant them are sure to be used for this purpose. If to the freedom to use their talents and industry, which you owe them, you add political rights, which you do not owe them, these rights, in the hands of the greatest number, will inevitably encroach upon property. In all those countries that have representative assemblies, it is essential that these assemblies should be formed by property holders. Here we see not only does Constant want to keep property from the masses, but also political rights lest they be used to demand the equality which was ostensibly promised in the preceding revolution. Not only is the liberal concern for equality undermined here, but you also see what liberty means for the masses in the view of Constant, and many other classical liberals. The freedom to use their talents and industry, in short to sell their labour to the bourgeois elite of which Constant was a member, but not political rights, civil rights, democracy, or any of those nice things Wikipedia said liberalism entailed above. Indeed, democracy and government here are reserved only for the holders of property. The notion of laissez-faire, or free trade, which I discussed in my first video on the world food crisis, is in many ways an extension of this principle, as trade is seen to be an extension of property and, as such, free from the restrictions of the political world. Again, this is perfectly in line with maintaining the class interests of bourgeois liberals. So here, we see the contradictions of classical economic liberalism and the social and political liberalism we more commonly think of writ large. I mean, yeah, they love to talk about equality, justice, democracy, and liberty, civil rights, and so forth. But when it comes to questioning their own wealth and class position to enact it, suddenly these demands are too much. These things must be cut off from the political sphere and the political rights of the masses curtailed to protect them. That is not to say that many liberals did not believe they were working for a society that lived up to their universalist ethical ideals, even if their class interests blinded them to how their ideas would undermine them. One such naive self-contradiction seems to me to be in Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. While laying out his economic principles, principles based on the practices which had brought the bourgeois to wealth and power, and whose following would surely cement that position, he at the same time manages to say this of the dangers of propertied classes controlling government. There, the merchants and manufacturers, the capitalists of Smith's time, superiority over the country gentlemen is not so much in their knowledge of the public interest as in their having a better knowledge of their own interest than he has of his. It is by this superior knowledge of their own interest that they have frequently imposed upon him to give up both his own interest and that of the public. The interest of dealers is always in some respects different from, and even opposite to, that of the public. The proposal of any new law or regulation of commerce which comes from this order ought always to be listened to with great precaution, and ought never be adopted till examined not only with the most scrupulous, but also the most suspicious attention. It comes from an order of men who have generally an interest to deceive and even oppress the public, 
and who accordingly have, upon many occasions, both deceived and oppressed it. So we can see that Smith is surprisingly aware of and warns against the dangers of simply empowering the rich, even as he sets out an economic system that will surely do so. And yet, he just says it will be fine, seemingly hoping that the universal ethics of liberals will win out over the tendency to permit plutocracy, or the rule of the rich. Unfortunately, as we see today, this did not happen, and wealth's corrupting power in politics has been allowed to run riot despite these naive warnings from Smith. However, many liberals in fact noticed these contradictions and, all too often, came down on the side of property over political rights. This is especially true as, with the working class becoming increasingly self-aware of their own interests, history moved forward and democratic institutions grew up and expanded, giving some voice to the masses' ideas and opposition to the hoarding of property. We see this in the words of another French 19th century liberal, Alexis de Tocqueville, who bemoans this democratic threat to property. When the right to property was merely the basis of many other rights, it could easily be defended, or rather, it was not attacked. But now that the right to property is the last remnant of a destroyed aristocratic world, and it alone stands, an isolated privilege in a leveled society, it is in great danger. It alone now has to face the direct and incessant impacts of democratic opinions. Soon, the political struggle will be between the haves and the have-nots. Property will be the great battlefield. Do you think it is by chance that on every side we see strange doctrines appearing, all of which deny the right of property? Who can fail to recognise in this the last symptom of the old democratic disease of the times, whose crisis is perhaps approaching? So for de Tocqueville, democracy, far from a key liberal value, is a disease. And it is a disease because it allows those whom the regime of property excludes to demand their inclusion in the society. What we see here is in fact that the logical conclusion of liberalism's social claims, its universal ethics and its concern with liberty, equality and civil rights and so on, is effectively socialism. But socialism requires them to act against their class self-interest and share their wealth and property with the masses, those whose labour produces their wealth, to end the ring-fencing of property and bring it into the political sphere. And this was a compromise they were so unwilling to make, they were willing to curtail their social values to prevent it. In the extreme form, this philosophy leads out of liberalism and into the darker path of fascism, but that's something I will come to in more detail in the last two videos of this project. So to avoid a socialist conclusion, the liberals had to come up with a range of excuses to explain why their universal values could in fact exclude the majority of the population. And, well, they came up with quite a few. The first is that the poor are basically stupid and can't think for themselves and have to be controlled. This is amply identified by John Locke when he talks about the possibility of educating the masses to take part in society by taking ethical decisions. You may assume hope to have all the day labourers and tradesmen, the spinsters and dairy maids, perfect mathematicians, as to have them perfect ethics in this way. Hearing plain commands is the sure and only course to bring them to obedience and practice. The greatest part cannot know and therefore they must believe. Pretty high and mighty for a slave owner to disavow the masses' sense of ethics, I know, and of course, an employer. In both respects, someone who has an interest in maintaining this role of obedience for the masses, that he may continue to profit from their labour. This distaste for the masses and attempts to exclude them extend throughout much of liberal theory and practice, as we shall see. The project of proving the lower classes inferior to avoid including them in the liberty of liberalism got a perceived extra boost in the emergence of Darwinism. Survival of the fittest was allegorically overlaid onto human social structures to make the enduringly scientific-sounding excuse of social Darwinism. Social Darwinism served well to answer the question of why a society that claimed to promote equality was so unequal, proposing we all start equal, but obviously the more evolutionarily well-prepared of us do better and achieve higher positions. Not only does this sound reassuringly scientific, what with all that Darwin and evolution stuff, but also suggests any attempt to level society would be contrary to evolution a sentiment reflected in the low view of the masses by liberal philosophers cited earlier. But the other thing you need to know about social Darwinism is that it's totally wrong and patently ridiculous. Social Darwinism basically says that human inequality is due to the natural evolutionary superiority of those with all the money. And well, look how that turns out. One of the obvious reasons this is utterly unfounded, though, is that not everyone starts equally in these liberal societies. Given the defence of property extends generally to the inheritance of wealth, 
those who get rich in one generation are able to pass it on to their children with no demonstration of capability. This allows the formation of social classes. This is exasperated over generations if, say, one class of people is treated to arbitrary restrictions on their ability to own wealth and property for arbitrary reasons, such as being a woman, as women weren't allowed to own property in most cases for much of the 18th and 19th century, or race, and of course we see a lot of that in our society, say through institutions like slavery, or patriarchal forms of empire where people of colour were not trusted to run their own countries, often enforced through forms of institutional racism. And this is one of the reasons people of colour in Western countries are generally worse off than their white peers. ContraPoint's video on racism in America goes deeper into this using some good examples, and I will link to it in the description, in case any viewers haven't seen it. A second reason social Darwinism is absurd is because it equates human-created structures, such as the market and employment systems, with life in a natural environment, as though the same adaptations can suit both. This is again ridiculous. Natural environments have shared resources, and generally don't involve competition unless necessitated. It is a misreading of Darwin to claim that a constant state of internal species competition, or even competition between species, is the sole motivator of evolution. Which brings us on to the third problem. It ignores mutual aid, a driver of evolution, commented on by many theorists, including Peter Kropotkin, who wrote a book on it, and Darwin himself. This leads us to a fourth problem, which is that individual competition within the species is not only not the only driver for evolution, but also doesn't match with the apparent course of our own human evolution. Do we think that early man fought off saber-toothed tigers or whatever with his superior individual strength? That he was a loner rejecting aid to all but perhaps their family? If anyone's actually suggesting this, I'd like to see them go one-on-one -on -one against a tiger, even if it's not saber-toothed. But I'd say looking at how we evolved as social creatures, from social creatures, and how we're not all armoured and spiky for individual combat, it seems like mutual aid and using the strong to protect the weak was probably a big part of human evolution. So social Darwinism is an absurd and disgusting theory which claims a false scientific basis in Darwin, but it is great for boosting liberal bourgeois capitalism, partially because it marries so well with the much lauded liberal notion of individualism by implying that all people's actions and positions in society are simply a result of their individual actions. Many people like to use individualist as a complementary phrase to support liberal and capitalist ideologies. This is often done to define capitalism positively against the horrors of socialist collectivism. Individualism. Pro-capitalist, let's say fair, economic freedom and individualism. That is what this country needs today. One of the things we're doing right, for example, is that we actually value the individual, right? The individual has intrinsic value in Western societies. It is impossible to understand neo-progressivism or the motivations of neo-progressive activists without understanding the dichotomy of individualism and collectivism. Liberal philosophy has essentially been subverted by continental collectivism. But frankly, I think this distinction is kind of irrelevant in general and in the form taken in liberal capitalism, individualism is actually a pretty nasty idea. So let's take those two claims one at a time. First, is individualism versus collectivism an irrelevant distinction? Well, these are terms which can have meaning, but they need far more definition. For example, socialist societies in which income is equalised are often referred to as collectivist, and we can see how this makes sense. Wealth is shared collectively. But this could equally be read as an individualistic society, and this reading can be made in relation to supposedly individualistic liberal capitalism. Under an egalitarian system, where all citizens have equal access to society's resources, an individual is liberated to choose a path in life by having equal access to the things that they need to live and make these decisions. Whereas in a liberal capitalist society, the majority of individuals are forced to work in order to collectively furnish the valued owners of property with the profits to which they are supposedly entitled. So in this way we could see both systems as both individualistic and collective modes of organising society. And this is effectively the point. Any society has a balance of individualism and collectivism. What matters is not the terms, but how they function in their practice, what meaning they are given in that system. In other words, both these systems have individualistic and collective formulations. But it's the nature of these concepts, in two different forms, that makes the difference. The individualism of the equal society is of a very different quality to that of the liberal capitalist society. This brings me to the other point, that the nature of the specific individualism offered by liberal bourgeois capitalism is not a desirable one. So what is individualism for classical liberalism? Well, Dr. Nigel Ashford, who we saw just before in those clips, 
says that the key aspect of liberal individualism is that no individual need is ever expendable for the communal good, and he uses socialism and fascism as examples of societies where the individual is expendable for the communal good. Individualism. That the individual is more important than the collective. We should not sacrifice the interests of individuals for what some people argue is the common good. This was the central feature of communism and fascism. The individuals didn't matter. Every individual matters. Every individual is worthy of respect. This all sounds very laudable. Of course, we don't want to live in a society where our lives are constantly open to being sacrificed for the whims of society, or where mass societal cleansing, as happened under fascism, is possible. However, do we really feel like our lives are entirely free from sacrifice for a greater good? It seems sometimes we may be expendable, say, in wars, which imperialist liberalism has quite a few of, or through our labour. Remember, liberalism emerged coupled with the development and interests of the Industrial Revolution, which, in its early days, was brutal in its lack of concern for workers' well-being and safety. Is our safety protected from sacrifice to the good of the rich few, if they can't, for example, be bothered to shell out for fireproof insulation, or proper workplace protections? Were these individuals valued above the collective good, or at least the good of certain individuals? It seems there is some limit on which individuals are protected, and it's not so much the collective good, but the good of these few for which they may be sacrificed. So how does individualism actually function under liberalism and capitalism? Essentially, in its most positive framing, liberal individualism claims that market structures and individual private property incentivize and empower the hard-working individuals with the good ideas to gather manpower to realise them and get the benefit of their creativity, and create jobs and wealth for those below who are not so creative and amazing. This is epitomised in the work of someone like Anne Rand, but it's naturally a subtext to any liberal discourse that accepts capitalism. But this way of framing it very much seems to be viewed from the side of the successful entrepreneur, and of course, ignores the historic wealth inequality and legal discrimination we discussed earlier. And of course, because in practice, it's rarely the inventor of something in capitalism who makes the most money from it. Usually it will be bought by some company, or will be done while already working for them, and they will gain the profit from the worker's creativity. What about all the people below who have to work to facilitate these supposed great geniuses of capitalism? Well, one philosopher who looked at it from that angle, and still endorsed it, was the conservative philosopher Edmund Burke. Now, he may be a conservative, but he is still describing the same system here, and in terms which better and more frankly highlight how the individualist-collectivist dynamic works in liberal capitalist societies. A spirit of innovation is generally the result of a selfish temper and confined views. People will not look forward to prosperity who do not look back to their ancestors. Besides, the people of England well know that the idea of inheritance furnishes a pure principle of conservation and a sure principle of transmission. Whatever advantages are obtained by a state proceeding on these maxims are locked fast as in a sort of family settlement. In this choice of inheritance, we have given to our frame of polity the image of a relation of blood. And later, each contract of each particular state is but a clause in the great primeval contract linking lower and higher natures, each in their appointed place. In these two quotes, we see an honest explanation of how this liberal individualism works in practice. The selfish individualist is seen as more capable of innovation, and so for him, individualism is the liberty claimed above by Dr. Ashford. But Burke sees this as a hereditary trait, and so sees inheritance as a way of preserving the just status quo between a deserving innovative rich and a servile poor, who he expects to feel tied to the state in a familial way, presumably taking the innovative inheritors as their patriarchs, and stay in their appointed place, working collectively for the benefit of these supreme individuals. So from this angle, liberal capitalism is, for the majority of the population, a collectivist effort to give liberty to the few entitled individuals. Personally, I don't think this sounds like a particularly appealing vision of individualism or collectivism, and a form of individual liberty which is predicated on the collective labour of millions required to carry through these few individuals' wills for the benefit, primarily, of the same few individuals. This sounds a bit wrong to me. I much preferred that left individualism, where we provide everyone with the resources to support them in unlocking their own individual potential, rather than stifling the majority to serve a few. This thinking is also laid bare in the words of John Bowring, a British liberal and an acolyte of Jeremy Bentham, where, speaking of the conditions of the handloom weavers, impoverished by the industrial mills, which the liberal laissez-faire economy had allowed to take their livelihoods with no arrangement for their well-being, 
we see his attitude to the suffering of individuals lower in the social order. The handloom weavers are on the verge of a state beyond which human existence can hardly be sustained, and a very trifling check throws them into the regions of starvation. The national good cannot be purchased but at the expense of some individual evil. No advance was ever made in manufactures, but at some cost to those who are in the rear. So we see here that the national good, this familial relationship of which Burke spoke, requires that those in the rear suffer individual evils, and presumably these evils are justified on the good of the few who benefit from the system. This is sold as progress, but even if you accept that the technological change was required, where was the famous humanism and universalism of liberals when the weavers suffered? Nowhere to be seen. Again, individual liberty is clearly for the select few, and the rules of property and capitalist economics are left unquestionable, at least if the poor are the ones suffering. Looking at liberal social structures in this way also undermines the social contract theory famously espoused by many liberals. Seen through this lens, we see a social contract in liberal capitalism is merely a commitment on the largest part of the population to serve the richer few. Under a contract they never see or sign, and whose true nature is kept hidden behind conceptions of liberty and equality. And I'm not exaggerating in saying that liberals often attempt to hide the nature of their social order from view. Esotericism, in order to ensure the obedience of the masses, is in fact a doctrine with a rich history in liberalism. We already saw a hint of this from John Locke. Remember when he was saying how stupid the poor were? He finished by saying, Hearing plain commands is the sure and only course to bring them to obedience and practice. The greatest part cannot know, and therefore they must believe. This hints that for Locke, the way to control the masses was esotericism, by using prettier sounding words to hide your meaning, but using them in such a way that the initiated would understand what you actually meant, while the uninitiated would not. One person who takes this up from Locke is the modern conservative philosopher Leo Strauss. He perhaps may seem an odd character to reference in a discussion on classical liberalism, but he himself says, The conservatism of our age is identical with what originally was liberalism, leading him to the conclusion that being liberal in the original sense is so little incompatible with being conservative that generally speaking it goes together with a conservative posture. He praises Locke's esotericism, saying, Locke is closer to Machiavelli than he is generally said or thought to be. So what is this esotericism Strauss loves with reference to Locke? Strauss explains, Philosophy or science must remain the preserve of a small minority, and philosophers and scientists must respect the opinions on which society rests. Philosophers or scientists who hold this view are driven to employ a peculiar manner of writing which would enable them to reveal what they regard as the truth to the few, without endangering the unqualified commitment of the many opinions on which society rests. So we see here that Strauss, claiming identity with classical liberalism, endorses a mode of communication where truths that may disrupt the social order are told in such a way that only the elite may understand them accurately, while the uninitiated, those disadvantaged by the status quo, are kept out of the loop to prevent them from gaining a subversive understanding of their place. But does this 20th century conservative accurately reflect the history of classical liberalism? Well, we can try and answer that with a look at another classical liberal, the leading British constitutional thinker, liberal, and clearly beard aficionado, Walter Badgett, who has a really weird spelling for his name. I had to look up how to pronounce it. I think we can see a great parallel with what Strauss was talking about when he discusses the useful role of the Queen in maintaining the British liberal establishment. The use of the Queen, in a dignified capacity, is incalculable. Without her, in England, the present English government would fail and pass away. The Greek legislator had not to combine in his polity men like the labourers of Somersetshire. We have. We have whole classes unable to comprehend the idea of a constitution, unable to feel the least attachment to impersonal laws. Most do indeed vaguely know that there are some institutions beside the Queen and some rules by which she governs, but a vast number like their minds to dwell more upon her than upon anything else, and therefore she is inestimable. A republic has only difficult ideas in government. A constitutional monarchy has an easy idea too. It has a comprehensible element for the vacant many, as well as complex laws and notions for the inquiring few. So for Badgett, showing more than a few overtones of Locke's distaste for the poor, the Queen functions as a part of this esoteric discourse. She provides simple mythology for the masses, so the important men can get on with the work in the shadows. 
Of course there is a disingenuous feel here. If the masses are really so stupid, what is to fear from the labourers of Somersetshire? No, really the purpose of this ideology is to keep the masses stupid and prevent them from becoming aware of the exploitation of their labour, that great opinion on which Strauss felt society rests. What they fear is not the masses' stupidity, but that given access to and understanding of the system under which they live, they will realise that it works at their expense. With this incredibly dim view of the masses and fierce defence of property and laissez-faire, it seems therefore that the liberty, equality and civil rights that Wikipedia told us to expect may be off the table. What about the next value on this list? Democracy. We live in liberal democracies, so surely these classical liberals must be at least a bit into democracy, even if they hate the masses. And of course they were. Here's J.S. Mill giving a suitably impassioned defence of democracy. No government by a democracy or a numerous aristocracy, either its political acts or in the opinions, qualities and tone of mind which it fosters, ever did or could rise above mediocrity. Oh dear, this isn't what I expected. But surely it gets better. Surely he likes democracy a little bit? Except insofar as the sovereign many have let themselves be guided by the counsels and influence of a more highly gifted and instructed one or few. Ah, okay, so democracy is okay, as long as the masses just do whatever the superior elites tell them. Lovely. I could go on with more anti-democratic liberal quotes, but given we've already looked at the general hatred of the masses and wish to keep property relations and the economic system free of political contestation, I think you get the picture. But if you do want to find out more for yourself, have a Google, or have a look at Ishe Landers' The Apprentice's Sorcerer, which, as I said at the beginning of this project, provides a lot of the source material for this argument. I will also offer some more examples of anti-democratic liberalism in the following episode of this project when we look at liberalism in practice. For now though, suffice to say that a lot of classical liberals are pretty anti-democratic, and if there is to be democracy, many argue that its influence over property distribution and wealth should be strictly curtailed, either explicitly or by more covert means of esoteric discourses. Some other aspects of liberalism touted in the Wikipedia description were racial equality and internationalism the famous liberal PC brigade, I guess. And this seems reasonable on the surface. Classical liberals often present themselves as universalists, offering supposedly universal ethical theories such as Kant's categorical imperative or Bentham and Mill's utilitarian ethics. Incidentally, while I think considering various ethical theories is a good thing to do in decisions, I do think utilitarianism's attempt to form a mathematical theory of ethics is an interesting thought experiment, but leads down some pretty absurd roads in terms of its implications and practical use value. But maybe I'll talk about this in another video later, as it's not directly relevant here. But getting back to the point, as we've seen, these universalist ethics don't always seem to apply to the poor in their home countries. So let's see how liberal thinkers view this when it comes to other countries, and with races perceived as other. I'm sure you won't be surprised to find that, spoiler, classical liberalism certainly has some problems here too. I mentioned in the previous video that Philosophy Tube has a video out on racism and Kant and Mill called Is All Philosophy Just White Guys Jerking Off? So if you want a more detailed unpacking of examples of how white supremacist thinking infused much of early liberal thought, I advise you to go watch that. It is excellent, and it means I can make this video a little shorter. But I will just share with you one single, really bizarre quote from Kant to give you a taste of what's in this video, showing his tendency to the pseudo-scientific brand of racism that brands non-whites as subhuman with some really out there claims. Humanity exists in its greatest perfection in the white race. Clearly not in your case, Emmanuel Kant. The uh, <clears throat> are born white apart from their genitals and a ring around the navel, which are black. During the first month, blackness spreads across the whole body from these parts. And he goes on to compare this to Mill's more patriarchal racism. Seeing the natives of the countries occupied by the British Empire as in need of education by the superior, cleverer white man. But go watch Philosophy Tube's video if you want to see more. The link's in the description. So it seems their racial attitudes did not always live up to their claims to be applying a universal or humanistic ethics. But what about internationalism? Well, the problems for this are somewhat already betrayed when we've already discussed how most of these thinkers came from imperialist countries and came from a class which had in general become rich to a great extent off the profits of slavery and empire. But let's have a look at an example anyway, just for fun. And to do that, let's come back to John Bowring. Bowring, the Benthamite scholar we heard from earlier, was actually governor of Hong Kong between 1854 and 1859, playing a critical role in creating the conditions for the Second Opium War, which was, in case you don't know, 
a war where, under the justification of free trade, the British Empire attacked China for refusing to buy its opium, attacking a large country just for the right to continue selling them highly addictive drugs. It's the equivalent of America invading Turkey to enforce the sale of Marlboro cigarettes or something. Mill justified it in these terms. There are questions relating to interference with trade which are essentially questions of liberty, such as the prohibition of the importation of opium into China. All cases, in short, where the object of the interference is to make it impossible or difficult to obtain a particular commodity. These interferences are objectionable, not as infringements on the liberty of the producer or seller, but on that of the buyer. So we see here, for J.S. Mill, even war can be justified on the economic concerns of liberalism, although he tries to say that it's not for the British profits, but for the buyers. I'm sure the Chinese people were thrilled to suffer a British military assault in order to continue to have the right to buy opium from the British. In more general terms, the contemporary thinker Uday Singh Mehta sums up well the relationship between liberals and imperialism at this time. As a general rule, it is the liberal and progressive thinkers such as Bentham, both the Mills, and Macaulay, who endorse the empire as a legitimate form of political and commercial governance, who justify and accept its largely undemocratic and non-representative structure, who invoke as politically relevant categories such as history, ethnicity, civilizational hierarchies, and, occasionally, race and blood ties, and who fashion arguments for the empire's at least temporary necessity and foreseeable prolongation. This tendency to abandon socially liberal values in order to support war and empire is also related to many liberals' fervent embrace of the value of nationalism, again somewhat in contradiction to their claims of individualism and universalism. This was also a value Bowring was keen on, and we can see it working implicitly in the previous quotes of Burke and Badgett earlier, where the use of family and queen to secure the obedience of the masses as part of this collective community are clearly predicated on at least a parallel notion to nationalism. And, as we shall see towards the end of this series, nationalism has been a key aspect of liberal practice. One thing I also want to quickly mention here is on gender equality, another value Wikipedia lists. And here there is more of a mixed bag than other things, so I'll try and be fair. For example, J.S. Mill's essay on the subjugation of women at least opens with a straight assertion of women's equality. But of course this equality is not clear in every liberal thinker. For example, in Locke's Two Treaties of Government. One of the first things one might observe in looking for Locke's view of women in here is to find that if you look in the index, it has a number of entries for wives, but none at all for the word women in its own right. So clearly, for a start, he's not very interested in women who are not engaged in traditional marriages. And Locke, in this book, mostly talks about female agency and power in the family context, clearly presuming they do not enter government or public life. Within the family, he does imply in the first treaties that women and men hold equal power in parentage, but makes clear in the second that, should a conflict arise, the man is the one whose will should be followed. So all in all, I'd say it's not a clean sheet. If you want to know more about this, there's an article on Locke and women in the description. One final point I want to cover here is the liberal love of surveillance, as described by the philosopher Michel Foucault. To put it very briefly, a new mode of power brings with it new modes of knowing, new paradigms of knowledge, in this case inspired by the enlightenment tendency of liberal thought which led them to attempt to find mathematical rules for things like ethics and social problems. This has some benefits, but also some massive drawbacks, including a tendency to encourage control and data gathering through systems of bureaucracy and surveillance, in order to have the data to explore these subjects and also to enact the results of your research. This was exasperated by the fact that the newly ruling bourgeois thinkers, coming to prominence and power, needed new technologies in order to control and encourage conformity to the new systems. For example, humanist liberals who shied away from public execution expanded the new prison systems instead, building a psychological understanding of the criminal, as well as a system which confined and controlled their actions. It is notable that British liberal Jeremy Bentham devoted some of his time to designing such prisons, inventing the notion of the panopticon, a method of surveillance allowing every prisoner in a block to feel like they could at any time be spied upon. I could go on about this at more length, especially as Foucault is one of my favourite philosophers, but this video is long enough, so I'll save this for another time. So to sum up, we've seen how property and capitalist relations appear to overwrite the social side of liberalism for many of the key early liberal thinkers. We see here that the liberal desire to protect property at the expense of universalism and of the lives of the poor at home and abroad puts classical liberalism not alongside left philosophies such as socialism, communism or anarchism, the socialist one, not the silly thought experiment with the yellow and black flags which is basically an excuse for capitalist chills to think themselves somehow edgy and radical.
No, it's not a parallel to these socialistic philosophies. It's in fact very much the opposite to it. Of the values listed by Wikipedia at the start of this video, we now see that almost all have been shown to be open to compromise or even directly opposed by classical liberals, especially insofar as they may interfere with maintaining the system of property. The only ones remaining are secularism and freedom of religion. And I admit, though many of them were not secular, I don't have any big response to these points from liberal theory. But in the next video we will see that, in practice, even these ideas are on the table for liberals in order to maintain capitalism and imperialism. A cynical person may venture that these social values, purported by liberalism from its revolutionary genesis when it needed the support of the lower classes, may serve a similar function to that which we saw in the Queen for Badgett earlier. That is to say that they are simple, accessible concepts to lull the masses into a sense of security, and to mask their conditions. Or one could see them as the result of good-natured thinkers striving for universalism, but being held back by their failure to realise how they were blinkered by their class interests. Either way, the result is the same. As I said in the introduction, classical liberals, at least in theory, prove themselves to be bad custodians of the social and political liberal values. So I would argue, if you're serious about the values of the social liberal agenda, and those, rather than the economic side, are the aims you want to achieve, that's great, but it's not liberalism that's going to get you there. To meaningfully achieve those values requires a critique of capitalism, of class, of exploitation. In short, you need some form of socialism. We will see this point in further detail in the following video, where I will examine a quick cross-section of the history of liberalism in practice. So, thanks for listening again. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd just like to do some thanks and acknowledgements at the end. Firstly, because I didn't say at the beginning, although I did say in the middle, I'd like to emphasise that the core of this argument is an adaptation of the argument found in Ishe Lander's book, The Apprentice's Sorcerer, which is an excellent book. So if you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to explore these subjects in more depth, please go and have a read of it. And if you're really enjoying these videos, they take a long time to make, and it's quite a lot of work. So if you'd like to help me, you know, live and stuff under capitalism while I'm doing that, then maybe chuck me a dollar or so on Patreon. There's a link at the bottom of the screen now. And I'd like to give extra special thanks to my current patrons, George Soros and Peter Benzoni, and Thought Slime. You guys are amazing, and thanks so much for all the faith and support you've given me by offering money, and also Thought Slime being very nice and tweeting my videos out. So, thanks very much. You guys are great. I'd also like to thank my co-conspirator at Blue Legenda for doing all the original graphic design and animation for these videos. It really makes the videos look a lot better, so lots of thanks to them. And of course, to Django the Cat, who made a surprise appearance in this video. He is very cute, and hopefully will find more ways to be in the videos in the future. So with that, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Like, share, and subscribe, and all of these things. And comment and let me know what you think. And yeah, hope to see you next time. Bye!